Well, tributes are flowing from all sides of politics this morning following the death of former Labor leader Simon Crean. Joining me now live is his long-term Labor cabinet colleague, Bill Shorten. Thank you so much for joining us on what is a very sad day in Australian politics. You were close to Simon Crean. What are some of your best memories of him? Well, I've known Simon since... I was very young and I was the secretary of the Murrumbina branch and he was running for the... He was the new candidate running for the seat of Hotham in 1989 and 1990. So it's been a long journey. He's always been a source of advice to me. I've always admired his efforts in the union as general secretary of the Storm and Packers, president of the ACTU. He is in that great tradition of Labor moderates where you understand that you, you've got to represent the workers but the employer needs to make a profit that we're all in this together. I'm quite shocked. I only saw him in the last two weeks and, uh, you know, he was looking in pretty fine form, I'll be honest. So I, I most feel for Carol and his family who were his number one priority, but also for the people he worked alongside, like Bill Kelty and Martin Ferguson and Paul Keating. This will come a shock to everyone. And he had such an incredible career uh, in the Labor Party for so long. How would you describe his contribution to Australian politics? Well, in football and other sporting codes, they have a Hall of Fame. Uh, he would make the Hall of Fame of the Labor Party and of Australian politics. He's only one of about 23 people who've ever led the Labor Party in our history. Uh, he was a great regional uh, industries, regional sector minister in, prim in the primary sector. He was fantastic how he helped uh, access trade for Australia with the rest of the world. He believed in the Prices and Income Accord and worked closely supporting Paul Keating and Bill Kelty and Bob Hawke as they introduced Medicare. But perhaps one standout event is very clear to me. It was when he was leader of the opposition between 2001 and 2003. Back then, um, George Bush said there were weapons of mass destruction. John Howard signed Australia up to the Second Gulf War in, in Iraq. We've learned since, of course, there weren't weapons of mass destruction. It's very hard for an opposition leader on any day of the week, uh, but to oppose the drums of war at the time, Simon Crean said Australia shouldn't be supporting the war in Iraq. That's a very difficult call, and as you know, with opinion polls these days, you know, that's apparently more important than the position one takes. And he took a position, and it stood the test of time. I think history treated that position better than he was at the time. The other thing, of course, though, which I think should be said is that when it came to farewelling our troops who were serving Australia in this war, he went down and farewelled them. He made very clear that he didn't agree with the decision to go to war in Iraq, but once the decision was made, he and Labor would absolutely support the troops. They were doing their job and their families. He wasn't going to make the mistake in Vietnam where the soldiers got blamed for the political decision. So Simon had integrity and courage, and I think that decision will you know, re reflect long after, now, you know, we talk about his immediate positions he held. Oh, look, absolutely. And there were so many positions. Of course, you mentioned he was opposition leader uh, between 2001 to 2003. He didn't take the party to an election. Do you think that that mm. bothered him in his career, that he didn't quite make it to an election? I'm sure it was a disappointment. But what I'm also sure of, and Simon and I spoke about this over the journey, is that you don't let one event define you or one missed opportunity. And he was a man who realised it was a privilege to serve, be it Stormont and Packers in, you know, distribution centres in Victoria or uh, serving the arts as arts minister or trade or farmers or indeed leading the opposition. So I think he should be defined by his... Uh, Kindness, his courage, his sense of humour, his commitment to family. So one event doesn't make the man and um, or one opportunity he didn't have. I mean, goodness me, he was a North Melbourne supporter and there, you know, so, he, you know, he's, he's always been one to just stick by the side through uh, thick and thin. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just an absolute incredible career. And we've seen so many tributes today from both sides of politics. Mm, he really nice. was so well liked. What does that say about him as a person more broadly? Well, it says uh, it speaks volumes to his character. He was, uh, as my colleague Claire O'Neill uh, put, he was equally comfortable at a farm gate or on the factory floor. He was equally comfortable at the footy or going to the opera. There is a strong moderate 
strand in Labor which says that, of course, we represent people who are not given the same opportunities in life that some are born to, but he never was a, uh, a warrior who said that one side of politics is all wrong and the other side's all right. He was completely Labor, but he was a moderate, and he understood that this country works best when we bring people together, and I think that's a, a pretty valuable lesson which sometimes in the more adversarial age we live in right now gets forgotten. Mm. Mm, absolutely. It certainly does. Look, an incredible legacy and uh, tributes coming in, as we said, from all sides of politics. And thank you for sharing your story uh, about your time with him. Before we let you go, though, I just want to ask mm. you about the voice to parliament, the no vote. It's now overtaken the yes vote for the first time, according to the latest news poll. Does the government need to change its messaging strategy here? Well, I think the campaign and the referendum's moving to a different... Pace. Up to now, it's been a p political parliamentary debate. Now it's over to the people. Now all the referendum questions finalised and now all the necessary red tapes being gone through in Parliament. I, I remain optimistic that the notion that we should recognise our First Nations people in the nation's birth certificate and we should listen to them, there is nothing alien to the Australian way of life or that proposition. I um, All the other sort of post-colonial societies, the Americans, the Canadians, the New Zealanders, uh, people with sort of similar history of European settlement have made accommodations with their First Nations peoples. We're not doing anything radical. What we're doing is catching up with what's happened in the rest of the world, listening to people, recognising them on the nation's birth certificate. I think this is a very reasonable proposition in the great tradition of the Australian story, and I don't think anyone seriously thinks that a document written in the late 1890s should never be changed. And I, so I remain optimistic. And the Yes campaign, well, that's uh, yet to really get out of third gear. So I think we're going to see a lot more positivity, which is what Australians are looking for. All right, Bill Shorten, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you.